If you have been watching or listening to this podcast for some time, you know that I love having my fellow Miami Hurricanes on this show. But today's guest is extra special to me. My dear friend and fellow storyteller Lionel Moyes is joining me on the podcast. You may know him as an Emmy Award winning news anchor and reporter. You may know him as the owner of vegan Haitian food pop-up Poppy Soleil. And you may also know him as someone who came out publicly just one year ago sharing his HIV positive status. Lionel is an incredible, beautiful soul who loves spreading positivity, and he's opening up about all of that on today's episode. Our physical, mental, and emotional health is not just a want. It is a need for happy lives and prosperous businesses. Lift You Up is the podcast where we share inspiring health stories from business owners who are fulfilling their purpose to live their healthiest lives and helping you do the same. From former TV reporter to marketing entrepreneur and content creator, I care about sharing stories that matter and stories that connect us. I'm your host, Tamika Bickham, your health and wellness matchmaker. Well, today I'm so, so excited to welcome a close, dear friend of mine, Lionel Moyes, who is, I was going to say all the way in New York, but like you are literally around the corner right now here in South Florida. come to your house. We should have done this in person. (laughs) To let you all know, Lionel is a two-time Emmy Award journalist, Emmy Award winning journalist. He's currently the anchor correspondent for ABC Network TV and Radio where he has also won a Murrow Award. I did not know that. Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) And your newscasts are heard by millions around the country, which is absolutely amazing. Lionel's super talented. We were both in the same broadcast journalism program. So, you know, he's doing his thing. He's also hosted a number of shows, including Business Insider Today, and was co-anchor of the CBS2 Chicago weekday morning and midday news. And so much more. I know you're acting. You've started your own business, which we're going to talk more about. But... You give us the high level kind of who is Lionel Moyes? I am a human being, you know, I'm a journalist. I think that is just one facet of my life. I'm really into uh, finding a way that every career that I have, I feel like I've had multiple careers in my life already, (laughs) like I'm so old. Uh, I think they all boil down to happiness, happiness for myself and spreading joy to others. And so... With journalism, I feel like there's a lot of good that we can do in the stories that we tell, and I think that has been very rewarding. Um, But I'm also really into food. I'm a big foodie, and I thought that was really important for me to venture into the vegan space. One, because I love the joy that it brings people when I give them food, but also knowing that I'm exposing people to maybe healthier options and some of the decadence that we're used to growing up with. You know, along the way, I've had some bumps and I've been unemployed quite a few times on this journey. (laughs) Hey, haven't we all? (laughs) Haven't we all? But I feel like it's taught me uh, perseverance. And each time that I've been knocked down, I feel like I've climbed even higher uh, when I took that time to learn and reset and figure out what I wanted to do next. And so uh, I feel like I'm a man of many hats, but at the end of the day, I just want to be happy and spread happiness. So how have you been able to, because I I think it's super awesome and impressive that you've been able to still stay in the field as a storyteller, as a journalist, doing something that you love, but also find time to balance your other interests. You know, we are taught to be put in a box. And so when you have such an esteemed job, which I'm so grateful to, you know, say that I'm a journalist and to be in this field that we dreamt of one day being in, but then someone puts you in a box and they're like, well, you're a journalist, you can't cook food you know how dare you be an actor or try to do something else you can only do this one thing and I feel like uh one that is just absolutely ridiculous two I feel like the backgrounds that we have help us shake the table a little bit more when we're in a new field because we have a fresh approach Mm -hmm. so even you like you have a journalism field of course you're going to be a great storyteller and of course you can do interviews on a podcast but from the business aspect of it Like you're approaching it very different than someone who's always run a media business because you jumped into it as someone who was on the other side. And I feel like that allows you to have more innovation or to try things new. Mm. And I feel like that has helped me when I have like kind of jumped into these unknown waters. I think having a fresh perspective in the end has paid off, even if 
there was like a steep learning curve in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I feel like every job I've stepped into, there has been a tremendous learning curve. Uh, even with ABC, I got into the network there in radio, which I had never done. But I feel like that pushed me into being a better writer and storyteller once I got the hang of it as well. Mm. And so were you sh not sure, like having been mainly on TV and not having done radio, the principles are the same as far as storytelling, but how did you feel kind of going into radio? Were you not sure if you were gonna like it? <laughs> I did not think I would last, to be quite <laughs> honest. Um, you know, I started as a freelancer just working a couple days a week um, and the pandemic hit. And so what was supposed to be like, just kind of a little side job to kind of keep me uh, in the journalism field, allow me to tell some stories, to try something new. It ended up being my livelihood one, because the world shut down. There was no other job or audition that you're gonna get at that time. We barely could go outside. But I also saw how valuable our job was in real time, even more than I had known from the experience we had, because literally all of the newscasts that we were talking about were the livelihood of Americans in the world, mm. right? So, you know, everything that I was reporting on were things that we had to discuss in our household of keeping ourselves safe. And I feel like it kind of threw me into the water and I had to just learn how to swim. But on the flip, I feel like there was no crutch of a beautiful set or that great video it was just down to mm. writing and sound and i think it forced me to really use my writing skills that we had learned and and, and focused on but i didn't have the pretty video or the editor or the ability to be live in the field even being live on air it's you know on my iphone and so i, I think it pushed me to be a better journalist whether i knew that that was going to happen or not Mm -hmm. I can't imagine being a journalist in 2020. Like that year my, just blew up. <laughs> I was stuck living with two friends. Uh, the same stresses that we were all feeling and our family members were feeling when they had to stay home, that was personified because my home, which was supposed to be a safe space, was also a news studio. And so, you know, when I should be watching like Martin or something to kind of decompress, <laughs> you know, I'm talking about COVID numbers and death and destruction all day. And so that was difficult. Um, but in hindsight, I was grateful that I was with those friends at that mm -hmm. time because it, it forced me uh, to learn how to decompress and separate. And tell me about the acting. When did that come up? You know, what have you, what can we see you in? Oh, I hope about something more soon. No, um, <laughs> acting is something that I've always wanted to do. And it has been very tricky with news contracts because when you're on air in broadcast television, you know, they basically own your image and likeness for the period of time that you sign the contract. So you know this, you've been in contracts. It could be three years, it could be five years that they basically own all of that. And so there are rare moments where maybe a studio will approach you and the news organization will say, yes, I will let Tamika play that person. Mm -hmm. on that show. Usually only if you're playing a newscaster. Right. Um, and so when I was in transition and I wasn't in a contract and I started freelancing, I realized that I had an opportunity to kind of start going after this. And so I started putting together my tapes. I had been signed to an agency for years, but I was never able to really work on anything with them because I was in a contract. And so a couple things came up right before the pandemic as well. And I was able to shoot those shows. And from that time on, I remained a freelancer. And so I do have a little bit more flexibility now with the roles that I'm able to take. So I was able to do a couple shows, uh, Bull on CBS. I did the Red Line on CBS. Um, there was a show called Utopia on Amazon Prime, another end of the world show, even though they okay. cut out my scene, but I got to do that show. Um, and and it's been cool. You know, I started playing Tommy. Uh, Tommy as well with Edie Falco. I did a scene with her, which is like- That's super cool. So fortunately, a lot of those shows had been shot before the pandemic and they came out in the pandemic, uh, which I think was beneficial because there was a lack of content uh, at that time. And so shows that would have maybe only aired one time aired multiple times across multiple countries. And uh, I'm very fortunate 
uh, for that as well. Really, like none of our journeys are linear, right? And like we all can pull from different experiences, struggles, challenges, the high moments, different interests. And it, it feels like you've t- kind of pulled them all into one, you know, and like the acting can benefit you in the in the journalism aspect and being a journalist thinking on your feet you know, showing up live can also help you in the acting. We underestimate the uh, the vast array of skills that we develop in any job or situation that we do. So even if you're working that job that you're not happy about and it's not your end goal for your career, that could be teaching you a skill at that time that you don't even know you're gonna need later on, which is why I've learned maybe a little too late how important it is for us to be present in every moment. Naturally ambitious people, driven people, we're always looking to the next thing. And I I wouldn't say that you discovered it too late because I think it is something that most people realize as they get older, right? And as life knocks you down a few times, you're like, okay, this is this is teaching me something, right? So what were some of those things that have happened in your life that you feel like cause you to take a moment to pause and say, I want to be more present. When you get that dream job and you go on set and you get to do this every day, you're not like as driven as that person out of college who is willing to do anything and everything just to get a glimpse of yourself on air. And I think in those times that we get knocked down, we have to embrace that hustle and that innovation to get to the next step. Um, For me, there have been multiple moments in my life where I've been in between contracts and that is just the nature of the beast in acting. You could be in between shows, in news, you can be in between contracts. And that was very difficult for me to, one, have no income coming in or to be on unemployment, you know, after you've worked so hard and you've gotten your career and your degrees and you get this job and then it's like contracts done, nothing has come yet. Um, in those times, it has been very difficult to stay motivated and I've learned to like, you have to get up and, and have a routine. And so I love running. Running is good for me physically, yes. And I think mentally and emotionally, uh, it's like one of the few times that I can kind of shut my brain off, even though I'm still playing music, but I'm like, it's a yeah. form of meditation, but it taught me routine. Like the same way they say, get up and make your bed every day. Like if I run, that is going to force me to then shower because I'm going to be sweaty. I'm going to have coffee, which is then <laughs> going to wake me up, which means my day is going to be started. I'm going to probably make a smoothie with protein and fruit in it after. So I'm nourishing my body. I've already done, you know, five things that I needed to do before 10 a.m. versus, you know, sitting in the house sulking about it all day. Um, in those times, I've learned to be innovative as well. So the whole three things you need to know that came from a time where I didn't have a job and I wanted to still be in. I loved that, by clothes. the way. Thank that you. was so good. Thank you. You know, but I didn't want to be forgotten as a journalist. I'm like, y'all are not going to forget me even if I'm in my grandma's house right now. And so mm-hmm. that gave me something to do every day. And it ended up building an audience that I did not even expect to even now to this day. I had someone write me like two days ago, like, um, Please bring three things you need to know back. I will edit it for you if you need. Like, even if you're busy, I will do it for you. I liked it. And I didn't realize how many people that was touching. The other thing that really impacted me was the death of my father. I talk about that all the time. Mm-hmm. I had such an invincible feeling. And uh, I've always been the youngest person in school and in my friend group. And there was just this like youth that I had that I, I just thought I was untouchable. And like losing my dad at 25 really uh, grounded me. It really brought me back to reality in the sense of like our time here is limited and our time with people and moments are limited. And that really forced me to want to be present more because fortunately and unfortunately, I was way more present with my dad in like the last two years before he died. I moved to a city that I had never been to before the interview. He helped me find my apartment. Like, I didn't realize that these moments that I was loving, I'm like, oh my, I got my best friend here again, my dad is here. And then he was gone. Like, I got a call that he was in the hospital. I flew home, I saw him in the hospital the next day, he was dead. And that was a big wake up call for me because 
you don't have all this time. And so I, I'm happy that I learned to be present and I learned he was so full of life and very present. Like, stop worrying about that bill or that job will come. I remember like, you told me that. I remember you, you not, telling me that about didn't him. You about any of that <laughs> stuff. Like, the bills are going to die when you die too. After that, and I, I know, I mean, I haven't been in that situation myself, but I know that was so hard for you. But I saw a noticeable shift in you after that and that feeling of being more present. Sometimes I've had to like step back. Anytime someone, if you told me we're going to the moon for my birthday, I'm like, okay, I'll book it, I'll figure it out. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be there. We have to travel a lot of places. Before I'd be like, well, I need to save or I shouldn't take off work today or, oh, maybe I should stay put. Now I'm like, no, if I can do it, if I can make it happen. Uh, if, if I was to die today after this interview, there would be things that I would have wanted to accomplish, right? But I would be able to look back and say that like every day I made it the best day that I could make it and I really enjoyed it. You know, life ends short for a lot of people and, and I learned that the hard way with my father. Um, also, his death came after my diagnosis and I was already facing my own mortality. He knew, but internally as well, I was facing a lot of that and to then see him die right after that, that changed me. And and it's interesting for you to say that you saw it as my friend. I didn't even know that I was changing as much as I was changing at that time. Um, and it was a very dark time, but getting through mm -hmm. to the other side, I'm so grateful because I really have learned every day that I get up, I'm a little crabby until I have coffee, that is true, but I'm really Miss Sunshine once I have my cup mm -hmm. of coffee. Like, it doesn't matter how much you have to do. It doesn't matter if you have a penny in the bank. It's a great day because you woke up and I'm so grateful for that every day. So thank you also for, for sharing about your diagnosis. I know it was about a, a year ago that you came out publicly um, and, sh and shared an Instagram post about it. Why was that so important for you to do? And I know I it took some time. It took a lot of time and I almost had an anxiety attack that night when it happened i was actually in this house i'm in my house that i grew up with with my mom and i had gotten off work at four o'clock in the morning and i was like today's the day i'm gonna do it and i wrote the post shed a tear and i closed my phone and went to sleep i didn't even tell my mom so my mom wakes up and sees it on instagram even though she knew but like you didn't tell your mom that you were gonna share i didn't the tell post. her that i was gonna reveal it i didn't okay. I felt compelled to do it i did it and i said i'm not gonna think about it i'm gonna go to sleep i did not expect any of the reaction like the i was overwhelmed positively with emotion when i got up because i did not expect any of that i just was like i'm gonna post it and we'll see what happens for me i feel like as a journalist we are demanding that people be true and that they live in their truth and we're holding people accountable for not being true and i feel like in this field a lot of us can be very fake because we're so worried about the perception of others and with my diagnosis and it being a sexually transmitted disease then there's such a negative connotation that comes to it as if everyone didn't have to have sex to have children right so like it's almost like a news anchor how dare you have sex and then you have a sexually transmitted disease like it's so taboo like if it was cancer there would be a different level of sympathy that people would react to and not making a comparison at all but there's a different stigma that is attached to HIV. And I think that added to the fear that I had of coming out, will this affect my job? You know, will, will, will a network embrace it? Will someone subconsciously not hire me because of their internal bias that they have? You know, how will I be received by my friends and my family when I'm in their house? And you know, there's, there's things that people just don't know and don't understand. Right. And, and I've seen this firsthand in my own family dealing with this. And so, you know, there's a learning curve about it, but it's an even steeper learning curve because we don't speak enough about it. And so right. I felt like if I was to be an authentic journalist and if I'm gonna continue to be myself, just as important as it was for me to come out as gay, I thought it was important for me to reveal my diagnosis. I do not think that I owe that to anybody nor do I think that anyone else does. I think that's on everyone's own terms. But for me, it is easier for me to be real with mm -hmm. others and tell their real stories by me being real and living in my truth all the time. And so yeah. 
taking that off of me, it took a big burden off. And I feel like even the fact that we're having this conversation now, it can help make positive change. And if one person could hear me sharing my story and seeing that I got through it and they will be okay, if, if that can help one person, I feel like it is worth it. Because when I was diagnosed and I was on air, I was literally in the biggest depression of my life and had no one to talk to, especially in the industry about that. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing the newscast, all chipper, da -da 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 -da, and then as the show is off, I'm in my dressing room in the dark. I've had so many people reach out to me privately after I uh, revealed my status, <laughs> letting me know what it meant for them, and that let me know that I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Also, I've had no issue with work or a career since then if anything i feel that you know my platform has only grown from people using me to tell more of my truth and we forget that we're surrounded by all this love uh and it was overwhelming for me to be reminded of that i'm sure it was i mean it was overwhelming for me as a friend to to read what you wrote it was so beautiful flavor and read like all of the positive feedback as well um and, you know, it's also hard as a friend to realize that, like, you know, even as you're saying this now, that you needed that support. And obviously everyone has to get there in their own time. But, like, as your friend, we want to be there for you and support you in, in all the good things and, and the not so good things or the challenging things as well. So in a way, it's like, oh, I, I wish you could have you know leaned on me and I'm, or just so feeling like, like you know but i at the same hard. time everyone in, has in their hindsight i could have just picked up the phone and called anyone mm -hmm. you know and there was a friend uh, our friend colleen from um she was my only friend there she was in medical school and i did lean on her yeah. in that time and she literally like i probably took her whole life away for two years because she literally came to my house every day and just mm -hmm. sat there with me like and, you know, after I revealed it, and I'm like, I had all these people who I could have just called, but you're so worried and you're you're sinking, you know? And so this is a reminder of being present. We're, we're, we're so focused on, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it by myself, I don't need help. We do need the help. And, and we need to be okay leaning on others mm -hmm. and also showing up for others in the way that we need it. Absolutely. So the same way that I saw how gentle everyone was with me, and you are with me when I'm talking about something so sensitive or something mm. so sad, I need to keep that same energy when the tables are turned because yeah. I know what that meant for me and how that helped me literally stay alive. And yeah. others need that energy at different times for different mm. reasons. Absolutely. So I did print out your your post. I wanted to share a part okay. of it because I want, I want to talk about the, like what we can do and, I'm just gonna share a piece of what you you wrote here. Um, I've been blessed to have a platform as a journalist and I don't take the responsibility that comes with it lightly. HIV is not discussed enough. It is still taboo. There is still so much shame and judgment that is associated with it that hinders real conversations. HIV impacted my family far before my diagnosis, yet it's something we never really discussed. On World AIDS Day, so many will, will wear red ribbons, attend walks, and then wake up the next day and move on. We often treat HIV AIDS as an epidemic from the 80s or something that only impacts other groups when it impacts us all. So being that this episode will come out around World AIDS Day, and I, I, I like that, that point that you made there about, you know, People will participate or they'll show a post or participate in a walk that day. But what can we do after that day or every day um, to help others? We need to be real. We need to talk. <laughs> so like, it is very important for you to discuss your status and ways to protect yourself with your partner. That is something that is not done enough, which is part of how this virus is spreading right. so rapidly. Uh, and also recognizing that it is not a gay disease. It yeah. is not a black disease. It does yeah. not discriminate. And mm -hmm. so if we only, the only time I have someone in my family 
before this moment, say something to me about HIV was when I revealed my status and it was kind of like, make sure you don't get AIDS. It wasn't like, hey, I see that you're an adult and you're in this relationship. Are you guys using protection or have you thought right. about prep? Or, you know, right. are you making sure that your partner's not cheating on you? It's like, oh, you're gay, make sure you don't get AIDS. But they're not saying that to my straight siblings who could equally be diagnosed. Right. And that in itself is a problem because that's why you're seeing that it's not just gay men who are getting new diagnoses. You know, this is this is spreading to, to other groups so far away. This has not been cured. This has not been eradicated. And so this is something that impacts us all. And I was feeling so like there's a certain level of shame and guilt that you feel when you get a diagnosis like this. And my mom said something to me like, you're acting like it's like like you did something wrong. Like anyone who had a child could be in your situation right now because clearly they were having unprotected sex unless there was another way that it happened right, right. but like this is this is a common thing this could have happened to anyone like right. we're gonna deal with this we're gonna move forward but it's not you didn't do anything wrong or the person that you are is not making you something that you should be ashamed of you know like you noted here it's not the epidemic from the 80s right and even if you do find yourself in this situation it's not necessarily a death sentence, right? And like it's kind not, of- and that, You can take medicine to prevent it. You can take medicine after exposure. You can take medicine if you have it and live a long, healthy, full life. You know, my doctors will tell me like, HIV is not what's gonna kill you. So you better watch your blood pressure and your sugar <laughs> and make right. it work out because it's gonna be right. something else you're gonna die from. Because it's so taboo, there are some people who would rather not get tested right. and they then end up not knowing their status and when they find out that they are positive it might be too late because they are so advanced in their sickness or illness because they were so worried about what the doctor may say what their family may say what they may feel so they will avoid getting tested knowing that they should simple conversations can literally save a life Absolutely. Or multiple lives. And the only way we're going to get to where HIV is an epidemic of the past is to end it. And the only way to do that is to protect ourselves. And after I revealed my diagnosis, I learned that there were so many of my close friends who I tell everything to who were dealing with the same thing mm -hmm. and didn't know that they were going through the same thing as me, that I was going through the same thing. We didn't, okay. we weren't there to support each other. Right. Uh, my mom said another, my mom, this lady, I, I just love her. Your but parents. She said, you are still you. And that is the biggest thing to remember, like in times like this, like we mm -hmm. act like a diagnosis just changes the person who's there. Yes, it may change the way they perceive the world, but I was still Lionel before and after my diagnosis, you know? People who are diagnosed with other illnesses, they're still them. They're still yeah. our cousins, our, our aunties, our friends. Our, and we need to remember that and keep that humanity in the conversation instead of, you know, putting a big red X on my forehead and, and moving on. But I want to make sure we talk about Poppy Soleil, which, you know, we got to get him going because he's getting ready for a pop up at the which is tomorrow at the time of this recording. Yes. But like you said, <laughs> Something else gonna kill you, and hey, I'm on I'm on the same vibe as that. It's gonna be that food you're eating over there. You know, it's gonna be that steak. It's gonna be the chicken breast. Don't get mad at me, y'all, because I don't. Me and me and me and, a, you me know, and, veganism <laughs> is, is a touchy subject. I know, I know, subject. I know, and I'm sure, especially in the Haitian community as well. It's terrible. I didn't expect people to react the way that they did because even when I went vegan in my family, they're like, Ugh, whatever. <laughs> As I started getting older, I just started freaking out about like eating things that were alive. And as I got more into like appreciating me being alive and valuing my time on this earth, it started getting weird for me to like kill something just to eat when I'm like such a hippie and I see all of these beautiful fruits and vegetables and plants that are like everywhere. I stopped eating like a lot of chicken and stuff. I stopped eating red meat, but I would get wings from a fish spot, which is sounds random. And I took a bite into a chicken one day and I put it down and that, I just never ate meat again. Just the bite of it, just something went off in my head and I was like, Ugh, why am I doing it? 
and that was it. So yeah. the only people in my family who went vegan before me were the ones who were Rastas or those who got like a terminal illness or something. And they're like, I want to change the way that I eat. You know, I love Haitian food. You know that I'm greedy. I think about <laughs> it all day. My life revolves around food. If I had another career and I can choose that, I would have went to culinary school and I would be a chef. But I, I was upset that everywhere I went, I could not find good Haitian food that I could eat. And I had to just learn how to make it myself. And so in the pandemic, while my friend and I were stuck there, we cooked like every day. And he's not even Haitian or fully vegan. I call him vegan adjacent, my friend Antoine. But he loves the Haitian food. And we were making, we were throwing down. Like, so we, you know, I've always wanted to have a food spot. And before I was vegan and we just kind of like had talked about ideas. He has a background in the food industry as well. Starting the company, we went to a vegan pop-up, one of the vegan block parties on my own as like a guest. And I saw all of these great food companies and there was no Haitian food. And I was like, I think I could do this. But the reaction from the Haitian community has been great. There's so many people who maybe wanted to try vegan Haitian food or maybe were more reluctant. Like my brother was very anti-vegan at first and he eats anything vegan that I make, especially Haitian food. Like, even if he can't come, he's texting me for a plate. He wants me to make something all the time. And so I think our culture and our community is, is waking up a little bit more to the importance of plants, whether it be for your health, for the animal's welfare or for the environment or all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I thought it was important to still make it flavorful and to make it familiar. Y'all, I went to his pop up at the festival. What was that in July? Um, July, yeah. 2022. So at the time of airing of this episode, about six months before, and you had the longest line at your stand. How? I don't even know. And we were not prepared for that, to be quite honest. I was like hoping that that would happen. The people just started coming. I did promote it a lot, and I was so happy that friends like you were like, I'm here. But most of the we're line wasn't y'all. The line was not people. <laughs> oh, yeah, I no. I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't wait in that line. You know, look, baby. He was going to make I me wait you, in the line. <laughs> I owe you a delivery plate. <laughs> um, but, but there were some friends who I saw pop up in the line, but it was mostly strangers. And I'm just so grateful that people gave us a try. I think, you know, innovation is important. So I saw so many other companies doing the burgers amazing already. They have the chicken sandwiches amazing already. I didn't want to compete against a company that already is doing it. I wanted to carve my own lane. And so that's how this idea came about. And it's only grown. My friend and I, we fight about what's going to be on the menu, what we're going to move and add, but it, it's fun. Like we're going to be greedy and we would be eating this stuff anyway. So <laughs> if I can make someone else happy and expose them to it, it, it makes me happy. But a lot of my family now, maybe they won't eat vegan or go vegan like me, but they are very open to eating vegan and trying vegan. And I'm not an elitist vegan. I don't care what you decide to do with your body. I'm not going right. to tell anyone else what to do. You're an adult. Just like I decided to stop eating meat. Someone told me I should have not done that. Right. But it is not as hard as you think. And you don't have to throw everything in your refrigerator and start from scratch. I would say <laughs> just try slowly. I slowly cut things and found different replacements. I tried to find more whole plant replacements. But even if you're craving a burger and you just don't want to get the burger, there's so many great brands that are out there that can give you a vegan burger. Maybe you don't want to eat that every day, but right. it's fine. Like if I want pizza, I can order a pizza now. That like was not a thing. Even before I was, yeah. vegan, I was lactose intolerant, I could not have, I've not had cheese since I was like in college when I learned the hard way, like stop playing with your body like this, you know? Mm -hmm. So there, there's so many great products and companies that are out there now. And you can just, you can try it even for one day out the week. It's exactly. not as hard as it seems. Exactly. Um, okay, so what's, ne oh no, I wanted to ask you about the, was it Impossible Foods that? Yes. Share, like tell, tell me about that because you shared a post with me where they featured you. Yeah, they have been great. So they featured our company for Black Business Month in August and they've been really supportive. Uh, they have the best social media manager ever. So I'm speaking on behalf of Poppy Soleil right now. Uh, if you ever post anything with their product, they will engage and they will elevate it. And on Fridays, they are highlighting small businesses who are using their products, which 
is invaluable. You know, people are paying money for advertising and uh, to get product to make. And they're, they've just been so amazing in that aspect of elevating not only our business, but other businesses, especially businesses that are owned by people of color and, my, and minorities. They've also sponsored some of our events. So our first pop-up they sponsored Amazing. and sent us product to help us create some of the things that we were trying to do. So our ribs are made from impossible beef and jackfruit. Um, you know, we, we use impossible beef when we're using a substitute, but they knew that we were having problems with getting access to a distributor as a small business and not knowing where to start and where to go. And they're like, look, we'll just help you out a little bit. They didn't ask for anything in return. We were not paid anything to do it. And, you know, that really showed that they're just trying to get their product out there and, and they believe in what they're doing. And these companies, I'm, I'm grateful. Any vegan company, if you tag them that you've done something or eaten something with it, they're going to repost it, not asking for anything in return. And we all know what that means starting a business. You know, if someone reposts the podcast, you might get a couple hey. more views or listens. And and listen, when people come on this podcast and they don't share it, they are not invited back. Yes, they're done. <laughs> um, they're it's, done. It's you know, we got to help each other. And so, you know, my business partner was able to reach out to them and, and they've supported us in lots of ways. And, uh, and I'm just grateful for that. They're They've inspired us to keep going and to innovate and figure out, you know, when they come out with a new product, I'm like, how can I make this into something else? Um, and, and so that's re that's really cool. What's next for the food business for Poppy Soleil? We are uh, in the process of getting all of our permits and stuff together to launch in New York. So we do want to bring some pop ups in New York. Um, the weather is going to be an issue as well. So that's why we continue with Florida as well. My end goal is to have a brick and mortar. Um, I would like it to be small, but I would like to be able to build a place in the community that people can come and enjoy our food uh, regularly and not have to fly to Florida or hunt us down every couple weeks or months when we do a pop up. And so that is my end goal. You know, we've, we've tried to do this business very lean. And so the yeah. pop up model has been very smart because we have no overhead and we've been able to build a following and test our products it, it means so much to get feedback like oh my gosh i love this and we know okay we need to make more of this jackfruit next time yeah this type of rice maybe wasn't the top seller do we need to promote it differently or we're figuring all this out now when we don't have right. one in staff um and so hopefully we'll be ready uh to launch but my goal is by next year to have a location in new york uh in brooklyn preferably um and hopefully the next time we talk on this podcast that would have happened and we'll be doing it from the back of my kitchen there that will be so awesome let's put it on the calendar lastly i ask every guest a health or happiness tip that you practice in your own life something easy and actionable that the audience can take away that you recommend they do just to show up as their best self each day be selfish with your time mm. And I've learned this, I always say the hard way later on, I will get up even for this podcast. I will shower and get ready and da, 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 da. boom, boom, boom. I'm not going to be late for Tamika. I'm going to be on the podcast at 10 o'clock at the time we're doing it. But if it's a gym, I might say, oh, I have to go to work. Or uh, if it's making myself a healthy breakfast or, you know, I like to meditate and I find myself uh, cutting into that time or taking that time away or running. I like to run in the morning and it's easy to be like, well, I have a busy day. I'm going to put it off. Yeah. Selfish with your time within reason, right? I'm not saying lock yourself in the house all day and don't talk to anyone. But if you need that 30 minutes to do whatever it is to set your day off right, it could be your ritual of having coffee. You know, for my mom, she walks the dog in the neighborhood. For me, it's going for a jog and making a smoothie and meditating. Like you have to do that because if you don't take care of yourself, you are useless to everyone else. It's okay, even if it's 10 minutes, find something yeah. that like is just for you and gets you grounded in the morning. Some people watch the sunrise. It could be anything. For me, it's meditating and running. I like I do that. Even if I wake up at 3 p.m., that is the first thing I do before I do anything else. Well, they say on a plane, put your oxygen mask on first before someone else is. Well, same idea. You don't want to pass out. You can't put the mask on your kid if you're passed out. You got to put the mask on yourself first. It's going to be hard as a mom to do that, right? 
but two seconds later, you're going to take care of your kid. Yeah. That's how you have to be with your, with your own time in terms of taking care of your mental health, physical health, emotional health, and your nourishment in the morning. Lionel, this has been amazing. You know, we could chat all day, but I'm glad like this served a dual purpose that we could catch up and connect and also share your story with their audience, create some awesome content for you, about you, that's also doing good and helping others. So I really appreciate it. Before we go, we got to tell everyone where to find you, connect with you on social, learn about P Poppy Soleil, and of course, we'll drop all those links below in the show notes. Yes, my <laughs> Instagram and Twitter for myself is Lionel Moise, L-I-O-N-E-L, M-O-I-S-E, and my business, Poppy Soleil, is also on Instagram and Twitter, at Poppy Soleil, Poppy like, Poppy, P-A-P-I, S-O-L-E-Y. And so on that page, we're posting some of the items that we make. Uh, we also advertise, since we are pop-up based right now, we advertise the next festival that we'll be at, where you can find us. You can always DM us if you have a special request as well. Uh, but congrats to you on this podcast and thank you for giving <laughs> all of us a platform. And I'm glad that this hour was uncancelable because I did get to catch up with my friend as well. <laughs> Thank you, Lionel. Listen, y'all, run, don't walk to get you some of that vegan Haitian food, Papi Soleil. All of their information is down below in the show notes, as is Lionel's. He's amazing to connect with, always spreading positivity and joy. So make sure you connect with him as well. And you know, for me, this was such a joy to do this episode because as storytellers, we often don't make ourselves the focus of the story. But even as a storyteller, you have a story worthy of being told told. And it was an honor for me to take part in this with Lionel today. I hope you enjoyed his story. Again, connect with him down below in the show notes. And hey, I'll say another reminder, connect with me as well. I'd love to see you all the places you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you there. And also hit subscribe on YouTube because you know what? We come back with new episodes every other week and I'd hate for you to miss out. So until I see you back next time, because I know I'll see you then, stay happy. Stay healthy.